Is the recording working now? It is, yes, Chair. Oh, oh, yes, you are. Oh, good afternoon. Welcome to the Special Planning Regulatory Regulatory and Licensing Committee, Wednesday, the 24th of August. Before we start the meeting, the Council Solicitor, Garrett Morgan, will outline the procedures to be followed today. Yeah. OK, I'd just like to remind everyone of some of the instructions included in the remote meeting protocol. Firstly, everyone will be muted and if you're asked to speak, you unmute yourself, speak and mute yourself again once you've finished. Secondly, if you have a question, press the virtual hand on the screen and the chair will invite you to speak one person at a time. Please do not sp begin speaking until the chair invites you in. Third, if you have a comment to make, you should only raise the symbol of a hand and when the chair asks for comments and again, you will be invited to speak one at a time. If for any reason a member has cause to leave the meeting, then they must indicate this to the chair before leaving and please raise your hand or send a message to the online chat. Next, the case law is very clear on this matter. You are not allowed to vote if you haven't heard the full debate. So if your screen freezes, but you have heard the whole debate, you may use your discretion over whether to vote. However, if you did not hear the whole debate, then you cannot, devote, cannot vote. And finally, when we come to the recommendations, you will be invited to vote. Just one last thing. Could I ask, please ask all officers and guests to turn off their cameras so that only elected members and lay members are on screen. You should turn on your camera and microphone whilst speaking on an item, but please turn them back off again afterwards. And the Democratic of Services Officer will now mute everyone and we can then begin the um, meeting. So back over to you, Chair. Right, the first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. Are there any apologies? Yes, Chair, we have Councillor Ernie Goldsworthy and Councillor Michelle Jones. Thanks. The next item on the agenda, are there any declarations of interest? No, no, no declarations of interest then. Uh, item three on the agenda, well, it's just the, the minutes of the meeting of the 14th of July, uh, fact finding visit. You'd all have read that. So item four on the agenda. On share, it, someone needs to move the minutes. Oh, and I, be, oh I beg them. your pardon. Yes, sorry. Yes, would someone like to move the minutes? Yes, Chair, I'd be happy to move the minutes. Is there a seconder? I second it, Chair. Oh, well, if we put it to the vote, we'll um, all those four, all those four votes now. Yeah. This is just to approve the minutes. So, the, yeah. So all those against. Put your hands down if you're against. And are there any abstentions? No. Also, oh, that that was approved. Uh, I, item four on the agenda. Uh, planning application P21 0170 Brintaf Garage Abavan. And I understand uh, Hugh is going to outline this report. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, David, you all right to put the presentation up? OK, thanks. Right. Um, OK, so this is uh, an application uh, for print up garage in Abavan. Uh, as members will note, the applicant has appealed to the Plan Planning and Environment Decision Wales, uh, often known as PEDU, because this application was not determined within the statutory eight week period. Um, that means the applicant has appealed against the non-determination non of the application. In such cases, uh, the committee are unable to determine the application, but must advise PEDU what, the, what decision it would have arrived at if it was able to determine the application. Uh, Chair, just quickly through you, can I ask if members require any further clarification regarding this issue, as it's the first time that I'm aware that someone has appealed non-determination in the nine years since I've been uh, employed by Merthyr Tidville. So just a, a quick, does anyone need any clarification on that point? 
Uh, no, Councillor no, no. Scott Thomas. Chair. Yeah. Oh, Scott, yes, is it? Yeah. Yes, Chair. Um, obviously, as the representative of the ward um, in the area, I would I would personally like a little bit more clarity on what that what this actually means, because obviously reading into what you were saying there, who um, this is just to ratify what decision we would have made or obviously the council would have come to. Um, what happens beyond that then? Because um, obviously, like I said, this has been uh, brought forward to a, an outside body outside of the, the, the council. Um, and obviously now it's being sort of brought to us to determine if it would have been, you know, done within time. Yeah, so so basically it's uh, it's an appeal process. So, for example, if we f refuse an application, the applicant's got a right to appeal that decision to uh, the plan inspectorate now called uh, Planning Environment and Wales Decisions. Um, this is the case that uh, there is something in the legislation to say if we don't determine an application within a period of time, uh, the applicant has got a right to appeal that decision and on determination appeal to uh, the plan inspector or as the other than known pedo. Um, so it, it basically means that uh, members of the committee um, assess the application as they normally would and make a recommendation, but we can't send a decision notice out on it. It's up to then us to send those recommendations to the plan inspectorate so they take them into account uh, when they're making the final decision on the application. So retrospectively then, the decision is completely out of our hands. We can only advise on what we would have determined. Um, so then, as you say, PEDU then would essentially have the final say in how this goes. Yeah. Absolutely. It's the same as any other plea, and really, if we refuse it, they have the final say anyway. But yeah, in this circumstances, um, I think it's important for uh, uh, us to put uh, as a council our recommendations forward that uh, that we would have made if we could have made a decision. But yeah, ultimately, it's uh, it's up to Pedro now to de determine the application. Well, great. Um, and obviously, one thing I'd, I'd, I'd sort of like to raise, obviously, as, a, as the ward member with obviously this this application being concerned, I would have actually been uh, appreciative to be privy of that information beforehand because obviously where residents have asked me questions, I haven't been able to give them that answer. Um, so it would have been nice and prevalent for me to be able to do that. So in the future, could we um, obviously consider passing that information on to the ward councillors so they can then feed that back to residents who have the concerns? Yeah, that's not a problem. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I ask you, Roberts, has the time factor changed? Has the system changed? And you mentioned eight weeks. When does the eight weeks start in this particular with, with this particular application? Yeah, the the time scales haven't changed at all. It's uh, it's it's always been an eight week determination period. Um, at the, at the time scale start when the application is validated. So when once we receive an application and it's valid, then the time starts from that period. Um, normally carry out all the consultations, get the responses from them, take everything into account, uh, make a, uh, a decision on it. The, the issue with this application is that there were a number of reports that were required to fully assess the application, which was submitted during the application process. Much, it, it, much the same as many major applications, to be honest with you, very few of them are, are, are determined within the statutory period, but um, the normally the, the agents realise that we this information is submitted uh, for us to be able to uh, determine the application. So it's it's not an unusual process that it goes beyond the eight uh, week period, but it is un, unusual in, in Merthyr Tidville that we've actually had an appeal against non-determination in this case. Yes, I mean, with most applications, you don't have all the necessary reports within the eight weeks. So in this case, they have decided as soon as the eight weeks is up to refer it to the um, planning inspector. Is that correct? Yeah, it's probably gone a, a fair way past the eight weeks, um, but it, it's as a result of us waiting for the reports. Then the consultants that we send, uh, consultees we send it out to to assess it and them to come back to us with with an answer to the to, to whether they got any objections to it. So it's it's probably has gone some time past the eight weeks, but um, yeah, it's as a result of us uh, waiting for further information and then the, the, the consultees are responding to us. Yeah, so the eight weeks 
that expired a while ago then, some weeks, was that a few months ago? Yes, that's correct, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, so, if everyone sorry. could put their hands down, unless you've got your question. Yeah, I've got another question, question if, if that's okay. Oh, yes. Um, obviously, sorry to jump back in, but obviously, should we follow officer's recommendation in this case? Um, do we have a provisional timescale of how long it would take then PEDU to come up with their own decision, or is that something then that's completely outside of our out of our grasp? Yeah, it's completely outside our grasp. Um, I know they've had the the appeal uh, for some time now, um, and we haven't received a formal confirmation that they've actually started the appeal process. So probably answers your previous question with regard to uh, why weren't you notified of it is because actually the, the local authority haven't been notified of it um, formally to say that we've got a start date for that appeal. So yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it, it's outside our hands. And I don't know uh, um, Peru, for example, a, a long we got a number of appeals in the system that we haven't received uh, any answers to yet. Um, so they way behind on their appeal processes as we are. Um, as I understand it, it's a, as a result of um, them changing from Planning Inspector at Wales to uh, uh, PEDU and having a new uh, computer system that uh, isn't running as smoothly as they would like it. So we could be very much then a long way off a decision, which would then mean a long way off any work to be taken out in the area, should it then be approved by PEDU? Is that what, I, is that what we can get at? Yeah, I, I would have thought we're, we're months off. Uh, if 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 a recommendation was to refuse, and then we get by the time we get a start date, we're, we're months and months off uh, getting the decision. I would have thought from from Pedro on this application. Thank you again. That's obviously for for clarity for any members of the public from my ward who are watching as well. Thank you very much. So, oh, there's another hand up. I can't see who it is though. Um, That's me, Clive. All oh, right, go on. A uh, question for uh, for who I think um, who we've in in Dallas for East Street we had a little bit of um, uh, previous knowledge of uh, of planning in, the planning inspectorate um, and it cost the council I think thirty six thousand. Just quick question because the applicant has uh, appealed to the planning um, and environment decision Wales PEDU because the application was not determined within a statutory eight week period. Are the, are the council liable uh, for costs? You can claim costs uh, or go for costs against any appeal. Uh, they may claim that it's been unreasonable for us to take so much time to determine the application, but uh, there are certain reasons why that time period has been uh, there and it's clear and evidence in the submission of the information that we've got. So uh, we would uh, rigorously defend that if they did go for costs at appeal. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Oh, so if you'd like to continue then, Hugh. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I thought good discussion on that. It's, it's, we don't have them very often, so uh, I think it's important to uh, to uh, outline the reasons why we got there. Um, so this is an application, uh, an outline application for the erection of 14 dwellings and six apartments. Um, at this, at this outline stage, only the layout and access um, of the proposal are to be considered. However, as we'll see in these, the slides, uh, illustrative drawings of the proposed buildings have been submitted uh, with the application. Uh, you can see the application site there on screen. It's the red line boundary. Uh, it's a former quarry site and is, is currently um, a car maintenance uh, repair garage on the site. You can see probably see the buildings there in the middle of the site. Uh, that gives you a GIS overview of it, um, which is highlights the building is a little bit more. There's a, there's a really stiff, uh, steep cliff face where the uh, the wooded area is to the to the western boundary of the site, um, which will probably become apparent when we uh, show some photographs now. Dave, next slide, if you could. Right. Okay. So th so there's the uh, the lay the proposed layout of the site. Um, as you can see, the the wooded area around and the, and the stiff, steep steep cliff face, sorry, to the to the west, um, the existing road uh, to the right hand side, uh, probably part 
the access into it. If you see the access into it, just bear this in mind as we go through the uh, the uh, presentation. There's a dwelling uh, to the to the north of the access as you're coming in. That's that's an important dwelling that we've uh, we've considered when. Thanks, Dave, for pointing that out. Uh, that we're gonna we, we look at uh, particularly the impact of this uh, these uh, properties on that dwelling and other properties in the area, but particularly that property there. Thanks, Dave. Next slide. OK, so these are the illustrations that have been provided with the applications. They're not saying it's going to be looking like this, but what it does give, give us is an indication of the height and size of uh, the proposals in that area. You can probably just pick out um, the steep cliff face behind the dwellings just uh, below the wooded uh, area there. But as you can see there, they're, they're roughly three or four story, story houses um, and flats. Um, and that's we'll come on to their uh, their impact um, a little bit later, but that's just a, a quick illustration of what they look like. I think we've got another one as well, Dave. Yeah, that's that's a different angle of them, um, but it, as you can see, that you probably appreciate the cliff face a little bit more on that one to the to the rear of the the flats there, uh, and a, an illustration of 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 their heights as well. Thanks, Dave. OK, so just a couple of pictures uh, that uh, top pictures the, at the entrance into the site. You can probably see the uh, the, um, the car maintenance uh, buildings and uh, repair areas behind there. Uh, that's uh, that's an area. The second photograph is the the main street through it. As you can see, typical terrace street um, with some modern properties. The properties on the right hand side of that picture is the one we pointed out earlier, which is uh, will, will become uh, important as we go through the presentation as well. Um, as you can see, there's, there's car parks on either side of the road on that street. That's a view into the site. There's a couple of shipping containers at the front, uh, but at the back you can just pick out the uh, other bottom picture. Probably is best pick a picture the, uh, the the buildings which are used for car car repair and maintenance. Um, and to the right on the bottom picture, that's the property that uh, we highlighted there. As you can see, it's it's adjacent to the entrance to the site. Thanks, Dave. I think that might be it. The photographs. Yeah, thanks, Dave. OK, so as a result of the consultation exercise undertaken, uh, there were no objections. Um, as a re result of the publicity exercises undertaken, so we, we carried out a number of publicity exercises because we undertook, uh, as, a, as a result of receiving the additional reports we talked about, we had to go back at the consultation, uh, I think it was three times. Um, so there's, there's 12 letters of objection, nine of which are from the same person, and two petitions were received. Um, a comprehensive list of the objections is, is outlined on pages 10 to 13 of the report. Uh, but in summary, the main objections are it's unsustainable location, impact on ecology, uh, development is out of keeping with the area, there are highway safety concerns, loss of residential uh, immunity, the site is within a high risk coal mining area, and the impact on the setting of the Abervan Cemetery. Uh, as highlighted in the report, uh, the application is within the settlement boundary and therefore uh, is in a in a sustainable location in accordance with the local development plan. Therefore, the principle of residential development is acceptable. Uh, the, the head of engineering has assessed uh, the transport statement and has raised no objection to the proposal. Uh, a coal mining risk assessment and ecology report have also been submitted with the application. These have been assessed by the coal authority themselves and the council of ecologists who are satisfied that the development is acceptable in, in these respects, subject to relevant conditions being imposed. Uh, there would be limited impact on the set and set in the cemetery given its location, given the location of its site and the intervening urban development in that area. Uh, however, the development would have a detrimental impact on the character and appearance of the area uh, and would significantly harm the residential amenity of the occupier of the Springfield House. And that's the property uh, that we uh, pointed out earlier. Um, particularly in terms of the uh, character and appearance of the area, as, as, as said earlier, the, the area is, is principally made up of, of, of terrace properties um, which have a certain height. Uh, there are a couple of new, newer properties along the street, um, but the, 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 the prominent uh, dwellings in this area are, are, are simple uh, terrace properties uh, of, of a certain scale. Uh, it's felt that the, the, the properties that have been proposed at, at the scale uh, significantly uh, uh, are out of character with that area and will be harm significantly harmful to uh, and detriment to its character and appearance. And therefore, that's the uh, 
the first reason for refusal. The second re reason for refusal is the impact on uh, spring fee hogs from a loss of meaty point of view, um, uh, particularly with regard to uh, overlooking from any pro uh, any properties within that area. As you can see, it's right adjacent to the site. The properties to the rear have, have a significant overlook into to the garden area and result in loss of meaty. So, the, so therefore, it is recommended the application be refused uh, for the re reasons highlighted on page 22 of the report and that PEDU be informed of this decision. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, has anyone got any questions about this development? I can't see any hands. Is, is that uh, Scott Thomas? So oh, Scott, yes, Scott, sorry. Yeah, it, it, it's me and I, I just want to sort of thank the uh, before I, I go to my question respectively, I just want to thank the, the agents for obviously coming to this determination that, you know, it, and, and realising that obviously to refuse this one would, would is the right decision. Um, obviously, members will know of the area, you know, it's synonymous, you know, the, the cemetery is just up the road where victims of the Avalon disaster uh, are currently laid. Um, you know, and then this development is due to happen or would have been due to happen within 200 metres of that area. Now, obviously, works, dust, things like that, you know, it would have a massive, massive impact to it. So, so my concerns would have been, <laughs> um, obviously, would you would you want a high risk call authority area built upon? Uh, would, would you want a local residents, uh, you know, health and safety issues to cause major anxiety? Um, would the development, uh, you know, 15, 20 metres from your front door be acceptable? And would you really want to repeat the 1966? And those would be my only my only questions uh, on that. OK, okay th thanks. Has anyone else got any questions? Uh, if there are no, no, no questions, we've got, has anyone got any comments? No comments. There, there's no comments. Well, we'll go to the the. Uh, would someone like to propose the recommendation that the application be refused? Chair, on behalf of the residents of the Merthyrvale Ward and those residents within Brindhaf, I'd be absolutely thrilled to uh, approve the officer's recommendation of refusal of this uh, this development. Right. Is there a seconder? I'll second it. Second it. Well. We'll take it to the vote. So the recommendation be refused. So all in favour of the recommendation, vote now. This is for refusal. Thanks. If, if everyone lowers their hands. Is there any anyone ag against the recommendation? No. Are, are there any abstentions? No. Oh, so the, 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 the recommendation that the application be refused is carried. OK, th thanks very much. So uh, the next item on the agenda, application P21-0358, Landoff, Elm Tree Grove, Tynrod in. I understand David Cross is going to, to outline this application. Uh, yes, that's that's me, Chair. Okay, thank you. OK, so uh, the uh, on the slide here, this is the, the extent, the red line is the extent of the, the application site. There's an area to the south which is hatched, which is uh, part of a reptile um, uh, reptile uh, relocation area, which um, is sort of mentioned in the report, and this is uh, an aerial view of the site. So, this application relates to an area of land in Toyn Rodden, uh, situated to the south of uh, Penelverthe, between Wallhead Road to the west and Elm Tree Grove to the east. The site itself measures about five hectares uh, and is allocated for residential development which was the subject of public consultation as part of the adoption of the, the current LDP. Full planning permission is being sought for residential development comprising a total of 121 dwellings, which includes a mixture of terraced, semi-detached and detached dwellings, which range from one to five bedroom properties. So 
this uh, this slide here shows you the sort of the general layout um, of the development. Uh, the, as you can see, the development itself would include an area of open green space in the northern part of the side, uh, adjacent to the playground that's existing. So this is the the open space, um, which would include a, a natural play area. There would be a green corridor that extends through the centre of the site, and this would include an avenue of trees and hedgerows, and then it would link to a larger planted area of open space in the southern part of the site. Um, which integrates with the, the, the adjoining countryside and uh, a couple of uh, rights of way. These open spaces together with uh, rain gardens along the, the one side of the roads would also form part of a sustainable drainage system. The proposed dwellings would be positioned along the western boundary of the site, uh, where they would back on to the rear gardens of existing houses to try and integrate the development to the surrounding area. The dwellings would also be positioned on the eastern part of the site, adjacent to a woodland, although it's not shown here because this, this line here is actually the uh, a Welsh water easement, uh, but there's a, a woodland area uh, along this part of the site, uh, and that acts as a buffer between the development and what is a, a sort of a, a lane down the side. At the centre of the site, the, the dwellings are sort of generally positioned to have a frontage either onto the open spaces or onto some of the streets. As a result of the publicity exercise, there were no objections to the development received uh, from consultees. However, uh, in response to the publicity exercise, uh, 41 letters of objection were received together with a petition. A summary of the concerns are uh, of the concerns raised are set out on pages 27 and 28 of the report, which includes, uh, in summary, uh, traffic issues, air quality concerns. Uh, the loss of open space and uh, ecological impacts, amongst others. Since this report uh, was prepared, um, prepared, a further email has been received, which indicated uh, on following an online survey, uh, which was uh, had 137 responses. Uh, that's been submitted to us as well since the report's been finalised. Uh, so it's not referenced to in, in the report itself, but uh, having looked through the information, there was no no new issues raised. It was essentially uh, reiterating the same concerns. The planning consideration section of this report sets out the detailed assessment of the proposal. In essence, the principle of the development is deemed to be acceptable, given that the site is allocated for 120 residential units. The development would make a significant contribution towards the provision of new homes within a sustainable location, which includes the provision of affordable housing. The development has been appropriately designed to integrate the surrounding area and to minimise any of the potential amenity impacts. It's acknowledged that there are concerns with traffic movement and congestion within the vicinity of the site during peak times, and that the development would likely exacerbate these issues. However, appropriate highway improvement works could be implemented to mitigate these impacts as part of a wider strategy undertaken by the Highway Authority to improve traffic flow in the area, of which the developer would also make a contribution through the community infrastructure levy. The additional traffic generated by the development would have some impact on the air quality management area at the bottom of Toyne Hill. However, the development would not significantly increase the concentrations of uh, uh, nitrogen dioxide levels, which would remain with, within acceptable limits, so it wouldn't compromise that air quality management area. Whilst large areas of existing vegetation and, and immature woodland blocks would be lost across parts of the site, particularly um, along the western part of the site. Uh, it is noted that uh, a number, uh, a number of areas of landscaped areas of public open spaces would be created across the site, uh, and in, which would include a significant amount of planting, including native trees and hedgerows across um you know across the uh the, the boundaries and perimeters of those areas the development would the developments on the site would unavoidably have some ecological impact notably on foraging bats reptiles and nesting birds however appropriate mitigation enhancement measures would be implemented to avoid any harm and uh, to protect the, to protected species along with new and improved habitat environments so part of the development would you know, uh, looking to improve the grassland areas with obviously new planting as well. Um, and there's also additional planting 
uh, to be introduced along the, the woodland area there to strengthen that for foraging bats. It was highlighted in the fact finding visit earlier today uh, that photos had been taken of deer within the site. So further advice was sought from the planning division's ecologist. It's been indicated that deer do have some protection under the Deer Act 1991, but this relates largely to poaching and hunting. It does not give them or their habitat any special protection. Additionally, the Wildlife and Countryside Act does not specifically mention deer except in relation to releasing them into areas where there are invasive non-native species. Nor does the Conservation of Habitats and spe uh, Species Regulation mention deer in the list of European protected species. It was not clear from the photographs where the deer were spotted within the site or when the photos were taken, but notwithstanding this, there have been numerous surveys undertaken across the site with no evidence indicating the presence of deer. Given their low protection, it has been advised by the ecologist that measures could be put in place to minimise any harm, which could be included within the habitat management plan, which is already uh, put forward uh, under condition 23. For these reasons, it's set up in the report uh, that <coughs> is recommended that the application be approved, subject to the 28 conditions set out on pages 48 and 55. So, as I say, this is the general layout of the site. Um, I know concerns were raised during the fact finding visit about the ground stability, and obviously the circle hatched area are the areas of main concern from the coal authority's point of view. Uh, however, because the development keeps away from those areas outside of those exclusion zones, uh, the coal authority were, were generally happy with the development. Mm -hmm. So that's, this is just kind of a zoomed in. So you can see this area at the top, uh, this is where the sort of um, the sort of natural play area will be created. So there'll be sort of raised mounds uh, and stepping logs and things like that for for, for recreational use. Uh, these kind of thick dark green lines here. These are the um, uh, the rain gardens I mentioned. So these are planted areas which help um, to collect the surface water. Uh, channeling it down to the southern part of the site uh, and obviously the planting of these um, sort of adds to the bio biodiversity interest of the site. So this is the southern part. So even though these look like ponds, these are actually dry, dry areas, but they act as a um, an, an area where surface water can be retained and then subsequently discharged into a water course at the appropriate rate. Along this line here, there's also a uh, active travel route which is to be provided, which links all the way up to Penilverta to sort to encourage well the links to the countryside and the existing trails there, but also to uh, support uh, active travel. So these are just a couple of examples of the uh, different house types that might be there. There's I think I think I mentioned there was like thirteen in total. Um, but so this is a typical uh, uh, sort of terrace property, uh, which can be also semi detached in some cases. This is a typical uh, detached property. In some areas of the site, particularly in the southern part where you've got the large open space, some of the properties that front onto it uh, are three storey in nature and they would have this sort of appearance uh, typically with like a sort of a Juliet balcony on the front. Many of the houses across the site um, will have um, carports uh, to accommodate parking. So it's very much like an integral garage, but they're not enclosed. Uh, and that's uh, been designed to try and reduce the amount of parking to the front of houses uh, and to sort of allow the, the properties and the streets to, to be the, the centrepiece. I know we've uh, visited the site uh, this morning, but just to sort of refresh you, this is a, a photo taken from the southern corner of the site. So behind where I've taken that picture is the, the path that leads to uh, the garages uh, by an iron crescent. So the, the, the trees in the far distance there, that's along the eastern boundary of the site. The trees just here on the right um, form the sort of the southern boundary where the um, the water, uh, the water features, uh, the or the, sud, the suds features, and um, the open space would be located. So this is just to give you a general feel from the centre of the site. So obviously, uh, some of the key areas where 
vegetation is located is along the uh, western boundary. There's some ad hoc um, bits of vegetation within the centre, and then there's obviously the the, uh, the woodland area um, along the eastern part of the site. Just to give you an idea of uh, sort of the relationship, but currently uh, with the existing properties. So at the moment, when you're looking at the properties along the western part of the site, there is some plant in there which uh, is set back from those properties uh, and sort of provides a bit of a buffer. Obviously, as a result of the development, you know, that, that would that environment would change uh, when you get closer to some of those areas. This is what you are. You see beyond that woodland area. So in a lot of places, there's grassed areas with scrub vegetation uh, generally sort of located next to the um, the rear boundaries. This is roughly where we met uh, earlier today. Uh, so this is looking sort of generally in the direction or around sort of just to the right here is where the access, in, the main access into the site would be. Um, and then the land to the left of this image would be the where the, um, the natural play area would be. And just to give you sort of an idea of um, the, this is the, the other side of the woodland along the eastern part of the site. So the existing lane that sort of comes down a bit further behind me then is um is the uh, the existing water pump and this is the what the old farmhouse i think that's the, the end of the slides yep so if um, um that's everything for me um, and um if anyone's got any questions yes edwin got any questions uh. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Declan. Councillor Salmon. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first question. It's it's in regards to the traffic congestion. I, I think we brought it up earlier. Uh, it's on page. Uh, bear with me. In the report, if you're looking online, it's on page 13. Um, and it's in regards to the average queue length at the moment is 16 vehicles expected to rise to 24, uh, then to 43 and then to 68. Now I'm quite concerned where who said um, measures could be implemented um, if this plan and application were, were to get to go ahead. Um, it's like after the horse is bolted and I, I'm quite sure all, all councillors have had to put up with um, you know, residents contacting us uh, in regards to traffic problems um, and there's nothing we can do about it then. But now we've got a chance to actually make a decision beforehand, um, you know, to, to stop this extra traffic coming on. Who, what exactly, um, two questions, what exactly could be implemented and is it normal for um, highways to come in after a development to try and pick up the pieces? So in terms of the, the highway improvements, um, the, the, the main issue that was highlighted as part of uh, the, the assessments was the impact on the junction going on to Goat Mill Road. Uh, I think the assessment actually uh, indicated that the development would increase the amount of traffic uh, would, would result in a 2.72 percent increase in the overall amount of traffic on that junction so normally that's quite that's considered to be quite low um welsh government advice is usually that anything above five percent is typically seen to to have a a, a a material change um the the issue with that junction though is the uh, the fact that it's not a very good junction, I suppose, is one way of putting it. Um, in that, even though the traffic, the volume of traffic is low, um, there's a there's a scenario where drivers are often hesitant about leaving the junction because of its proximity to um, uh, the roundabout uh, and it's the need to give way. So there are measures that could be put in place to try and address that issue, and I think. On the the initial example that the applicant put forward, they suggested whether a mini roundabout could be introduced, which would um, basically alter the traffic priority and allow more vehicles coming up uh, Penelvia to, to actually uh, to leave. There seems to be roughly a, a sort of a, a, an even split of people wanting to turn left down Goat Mill Road and those that want to turn right towards the uh, the trunk road. 
the one of the concerns that uh, our engineers highlighted that was that is that obviously that changes the priority then of people coming um, in off the the trunk road, um, and there may be a, a, a scenario there where there's um, some vehicles then uh, queuing uh, to get onto uh, onto basically onto Goat Mill Road. Um, so there are some things that would need to look at. Uh, the highway engineers have also indicated that other options might be to uh, adjust the existing junction there. So it may be to, to widen it in parts. There seems to be some land uh, to, to one side, uh, which, uh, which, which enable them to, to create a, a bigger double lane, basically. So you could have more vehicles stack or, you know, or there may be other options of perhaps uh, traffic signals to, to adjust the, uh, the priority. So there are some options there. Um, with the in the case of the roundabout option, um, just to give you an idea of the effectiveness, is the 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 report that was submitted indicated that that the queue length, which was considered to be quite high, would be reduced to only a few number of vehicles. So that would suggest that you know with some intervention that the the queue can the queue length concerns would could be considerably reduced. Um, as for the congestion issues, I guess, uh, around the schools, I mean, that's not something the development itself can directly uh, resolve. That would need to be something that the highway um, department would need to look at as part of a wider strategy. I guess, from my understanding, a lot of the, the congestion is, is typically around the, sort of the school pick up and drop off. So th there are some um, measures that could be put in there. I've been told um, that the Toyne School has a car park which is often closed. That may help uh, address some of the traffic issues. It might not resolve it entirely, but it may assist in that. Um, if, the, if there was any changes to the catchment areas to the schools, that may mean that persons who live further away uh, are not having to drive to that school, uh, in which case that may reduce some traffic pressures. Um, the, develop, the development itself, I don't think, would have a significant impact in terms of the congestion uh, during school pickup and drop off times. Uh, my view is that the, the development is is well within walking distance, reasonable walking distance to the schools, uh, and that wouldn't be unreasonable to expect the majority of residents to, to do that. Or, albeit I know there was some scepticism about that um, in the site meeting earlier today. Thank you. Thank you, David. Chair, one more question. Um, this is regarding biodiversity uh, in the area. Uh, a lot of residents have mentioned that groundwork planted a lot of trees in this area uh, years ago. Um, so I'm just wondering, I, I believe this was council land. So the council in association with groundwork planted all these trees for biodiversity. Um, and and now it's kind of seems to be going back that it's, that it's quite happy to get rid of the biodiversity. Is is this normal? Well, the the trees within the site and the vegetation, I, I don't think has been particularly well managed over the years, which is probably why uh, the reports that we've received said that some of the woodland areas seem to be in poor condition. The, uh, and um, I think the was it undernourished or something like that. I have to get the exact words from my report, but um, so they didn't seem to be identified as uh, significant in uh, amenity value. Uh, some of the trees and vegetation there are um, referred to as immature woodlands, so they haven't fully, you know, they're not reached their full potential. Um, and the site itself, the, the vegetation within it, you know, is it's not there's no tree preservation orders or anything like that. So obviously um, what the developers tried to do is they've acknowledged that, you know, a lot of that vegetation, particularly on the western part of the site, would inevitably be lost uh, as, as a result of the development. But they've tried to compensate and mitigate for that through what I would consider a fairly extensive planting scheme across the site. Um, as you can see on the, the, the site layout, there's, you know, quite a number of trees to be planted within the, the open green spaces. Uh, there are also a number of trees and things planted within some of the front garden areas. Um, and there's quite an extensive uh, amount of hedgerow planting 
and um, uh, rain gardens, which also, you know, adds to that biodiversity interest. Uh, the uh, ecologist uh, has asked for additional planting to be considered along the uh, along the western, sorry, the eastern part of the site to, uh, in the form of, I think, um, uh, they wanted some more hedgerow planting there to sort of further bolster that use for foraging bats. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you, Chair. Uh, someone has got the hand up. I can't see yeah, who it is. John so. Thomas. Oh, John, John Thomas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. First of all, I just follow on from Declan's point there with the traffic. Uh, you seem to be giving a lot of thought into the Goat Mill Road area which is rightly so but the roundabout outside now elm tree grove nobody seems to be speaking much about that because as you approach from elm tree out onto the main road if you look right you're in a total blind spot because of the wall of the house which is on top there and you can't see anything so for i to say they've got no objections how are they going to reconfigure that area in terms of the the junction, well, the reason why a lot of the, the sort of discussion has been related to the junction going on to Goatwood Road is because that was in the survey reports was identified to basically be the worst, um, the worst affected, albeit the traffic, uh, traffic amount on that was perhaps lower than the ones outside the site. Um, the other junctions generally looking down the hill towards um, all the way as far as uh, where Avenue de Clichy is, um, those uh, the majority of those junctions were considered to have, uh, you know, a one or two percent increase in traffic, which, as I say, was uh, is generally considered to be quite a low impact. The it was acknowledged that the junction, particularly outside the entrance to this site, um, would be worse affected more than the others because obviously all of the traffic would be uh, coming in and out of, of that, that's, that being the principal entrance to the site. But their assessment of that junction was that it could accommodate that traffic, um, notwithstanding, obviously, that there's during peak school times, there is, you know, more congestion in the area, which probably um, does have some impact on traffic flow. Um, my understanding is, uh, and it may be something that uh, Carolyn, uh, uh, you know, can sort of respond to, but I, I, as I understand it, they are already in the process of looking at those junctions and uh, looking at measures to put forward uh, to, to try and address that those traffic concerns. I, I, I see Carolyn's got his hand out. I don't know if he wants to come in there. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, David. Um, yeah, so th I think the reason why we we are not concerned or haven't objected regarding um, uh, the traffic issues is because we know there's pre-existing issues in these areas and we're already trying to address them anyway. Um, so the roundabout, for example, that you've mentioned, we've already got a draft design uh, ready, uh, which we'd be happy to share with you. Um, we literally we know we're looking to try and slow speeds up on approach to that roundabout uh, and to make it a more of a raised roundabout um so we feel that we can address those issues uh, which will, which is completely separate from 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 the, de the development yeah thank you carmen for that i've uh, i've got an ongoing issue with the speed of the traffic there yeah. Uh, with the police at the moment, they're going to be doing an exercise there with the, the speed of the traffic coming up the hill. You know, it's just totally unacceptable. And I did have a meeting with Martin, I thought they'd go regarding the parking around the shop and Bryony Close areas. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's residence issues, that is, over there, that is. That's, uh... Yeah, I mean, right, thanks, we, God, for that. We, the we other one, issues, um, again, sorry, we had issues with the, the zebra crossing where we, we've been told cars are not stopping. That's right, uh, yeah. For people to cross. So, again, our plan is to raise that zebra crossing. Um, I, you know, and obviously put, to put traffic calming measures on approach to it as well. So, as I say, we know there's existing issues there, uh, which we're already planning to address, um, which is why we're not uh, sort of objecting to the development, if you like. OK. The next one, um, my next question, Dave, is the uh, the road going into the site of Elm Tree Grove at the side of the the, ch the children's playground there? 
as you're going on the road, you'll have a, you've got the existing playground on the right, and then the other side of the road, you put on another playground. Surely, health and safety wise, you know, a child in one park would call his friend, run across the road as they do, they don't look, and then they get knocked over or whatever. So, I got grave concerns about that road by the side of the park, to be honest with you. Yeah, I I I, and I appreciate that. Um, obviously, the the playground itself is a sort of a contained area, um, but obviously there may be instances where children are uh, across in the road uh, to the to the sort of open space. Um, I guess I don't really have a, an answer for you other than to say that obviously at the point where there's a crossing, uh, I think the intention there is to provide a, a raised uh, section of the road which is to emphasise the pedestrian crossing. But obviously, uh, you know, there are, you know, there is a, an active travel route in the area. And, you know, in order to get to those play areas, you've already got to cross a number of roads anyway. Um, but I don't I don't think there was an alternative position for the for the road. And, and but obviously, as part of the application, we, we didn't have any highway safety concerns raised on that. So it was never, you know, altered from that. OK, so that leads me on to my next question then. Have they explored the bottom end of the site, if you like, to come out onto the slip road? Because that is the obvious route in and out with, with the slip road. You've got the Glimmeal site in the centre of the slip road. You've got all the roads there join in. Surely there could be a road in and out going that way, which will take all the traffic off the Toy Hill. And out of Elm Tree Grove. Uh, that and that was going to see if at the play as well, and in the green space left. That was something that was highlighted with the the developer um, when it was mentioned in some of the early discussions. Um, for various reasons, I think it was discounted because I think there's land ownership issues to to achieve that, but also it's it's not very often that uh, the Welsh government would allow. Uh, you know, new junctions coming off on to off of uh, busy trunk trunk roads due to their high speed. Um, so I think for those reasons, it, it wasn't explored any further. Um, I think as part of the housing allocation, obviously, uh, it was you know seen that the access would come from Penaversa, which would normally be the natural point of entry into the site. Uh, oh my. I got so many questions, I'm sorry, but um, oh, the air quality assessment. Uh, I note here from the, just bear with me a sec, the environmental health officer, and I quote on page six, that no objection and where possible large vehicles and plant should avoid the air quality management area do with the construction phase. How are they going to avoid the area? Which way are they going to be travelling? So we, we don't have a huge amount of control over traffic generally because obviously um, people are freely able to travel along the, the adopted roads where possible. Um, but uh, we've put a condition on there relating to uh, a construction management plan uh, where we've asked for uh, you know, a scheme to be put forward to encourage uh, deliveries and things like that to to approach the site, ideally from the top of the hill from Penelverse, uh, which would then avoid uh, traffic going through the air quality management area. Um, it's, uh, it, it's 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 something that we would be looking at for the developer to 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 adhere to as part of the condition. Then, yeah, but. You know, that, the, the heavy transport coming down that road, you know, is the road suitable for it, you know, for all that heavy traffic? I don't know if Carwin can answer that one. You know, they've done surveys on that. I don't think there's been any surveys specifically on uh, the, the the suitability of the site, uh, of the, the existing roads to accommodate uh, heavy traffic. But, you know, as part of the adopted highway, uh, I would have thought that they are to a suitable standard to accommodate large vehicles, as it would uh, already accommodate buses and uh, heavy good vehicle, um, um, you know, like refuge vehicles and things. But you know, I don't think we could refuse an application on the basis that uh, 
that that they're not allowed to use the adopted highways in order to develop the site. Um, I think that would, you know, prohibit any development in the area then if that was the case. Yeah, but you know, like I pointed out this morning, you know, in the site meeting, from the Peeler Parlour nursery up to the Farmers Arms Public House, all the residents are parked there, more or less all day, every day. You know, so with those big wagons coming down, and you're not going to have one there, you know, when they initially started the work, you're going to have quite the few back and forth. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be highly congested. I think uh, Cowan's got his hand up if he wants to come in. Yeah, I mean, I think it wouldn't be logical really for any a contractor to access the site via uh, via, via the town really and drive up to Hill. So I, I think it's inevitable that they would be coming off the A40, A4060 um, and down Toyn Hill. Um, I completely agree. Obviously, there are probably uh, parking issues along that road, but I think um, the road would be able to take the heavy traffic. Uh, it would be able to to withstand uh, lorries, um, and obviously they are going to have to negotiate their way through uh, through that, that section of road where, where there's parked vehicles, really. Yeah, so that brings me on to the air quality then, see, Carwin, because if you've got the cars in idling all the time, as we've said in the past, it's the cars going up, Bill, cause the problem more than vehicles coming down. I'm right to say that now, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I, it's difficult for me to comment really on the air quality issues, uh, but I believe they were lower down Tyne Hill and not up in this area. But again, I, I can't really comment on that really. No, I know that, but I think this is going to cause a problem how high, higher up. This is what we're going to find, I think. Hmm. I can see Clive got his hand up. I leave Clive come in. But, uh, I don't want to walk the, the floor. Oh, Councillor Jones? <laughs> Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. I, I, I'm quite happy for Councillor Thomas to continue because my questions are on some other aspects in the report. But if you, Councillor Thomas wants me to uh, um, ask some questions, I certainly will. Yeah, perhaps we'll bring Councillor Thomas in again then later. I, I just got two more to add then. I'll, oh. uh, um, which one should I start with? Right, I'll go back to what a resident emailed me earlier on this afternoon after the meeting, they were there. Uh, when this con uh, consultation came about first, it was 2000, March 2020. Residents of the Elm Grove area then uh, were sent initial consultation proposals. <coughs> so to date, the residents haven't received a reply or any emails or correspondence from Persimmon. And this is highly concerning to them as the public engagement is a key factor in such a big proposal. Are you aware of anything on that, uh, Dave? Uh, I would agree with you that uh, public engagement is certainly an important aspect, certainly on sites of this scale. Um, I'm not aware of what comments or emails have been sent to Persimmon and what they have, have or haven't replied to. Um, obviously, in terms of their statutory pre-application, um, they submitted a, a report um, setting out all the sort of responses and concerns that were raised uh, by residents and provided a response to those issues. Um, but as as in terms of uh, you know uh, you know replies to those individuals, I'm I'm not aware of of what those replies would be, if if any. No, there hasn't been any. That, <coughs> excuse me. There hasn't been any, and this is what I find a bit uh, disturbing, really, that they couldn't reply to the residents when they were asking questions. You know, it is a bit disturbing, and that's over two years ago now. But the last one for me is. Um, are the planning committee aware of any covenants on that field at this moment in time? I, I'm not aware of any particular covenants on the site. Uh, I know, as I said uh, earlier, there's uh, there's an easement uh, down the one side here, which I think there's a there's a drainage system there, and there's obviously a a, a small pumping station there present. Um, so I, I believe this is 
uh, there's an easement there. But as to any other covenants across the site, I'm not aware. Um, there is obviously the rights of way and bride away that cross through the site. I think the bride away crosses through the centre and one of the rights away crosses sort of along the alignment of the road and they sort of meet down. So those have uh, those have uh, protection um, and any sort of stopping up or diversion of those would be something that you know has to be agreed with rights of way. But other than that, I'm not aware of any other particular covenants. OK, thank you. Thanks. Oh, Councillor Jones. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to uh, start before I ask uh, some questions with a particular statement. I'm disappointed as a member of the Planning Committee, Chair, that the Planning Committee and the, the site meeting was called during August out of the out of the blue. And the reason I made that statement is that the site meeting this morning there were there was only one officer there, and that's David Cross, and no other officers um, outside the planning department, because no in normal circumstances a site meeting is voted on and called by the planning committee members themselves, and then they have the ability to determine which officers should be present at that meeting, and that's why I moved this morning for certain officers to be present tonight. And I note that there's at least one, um, maybe more, who are unable to attend. And I know that uh, uh, Sue is there as the Director of Education, so I asked the question, and I thank of a reply to my email, which I sent last night, in relation to the capacity of the Twin Rodin uh, school. And the answer given to my questions were that the full capacity of the school is 334 plus 57 um, in nursery. It's particularly the the um, the salient uh, issue there is from deception onwards um, of the, the parents are on obligation to send the children uh, to school. Uh, I also asked the question as to what will be the number of pupils on entry uh, next month. And the answer that was given was 279 plus the um, nursery uh, uh, figures as well. Now, the 120 properties there, um, could I ask um, to that leaves a uh, capacity of just over 40 um, from 120 properties. Um, I know that um, parents may decide to send their school for children, for example, to the Welsh school further away. Um, but is it anticipated by yourself and the head of the school that most of those children, if this application is approved, would be attending Tweedrodden School because clearly it is within easy walking distance and the closest to that site. Yeah, Councillor Jones, we would expect the children to actually go to their closest catchment school. And the figures that I gave you this morning are from September. There are, we are seeing um, a plateauing of numbers We're, um, in September. There will be 57 children in year six, but there are actually then average for the other year groups of just about 35 children. So the numbers actually currently in the area are go have gone down and have actually plateaued. So there's currently a capacity, a surplus capacity, as you said, of about 40 children. And we've got we've got capacity in nursery. So from an education perspective, from a um, an estate that size, we would expect another sort of class load, a number of about a class of children to be able to sort of attend that school. And certainly at the moment, um, Toyn has got the Toyn has got the capacity based on what what we would work on to have those additional children. What we are doing as well, and I think it's it's useful for members to know, is we have a very ambitious um, LDP, as you know, which will impact on a number of schools. 
So we are looking at the moment at looking at revising our catchment areas to ensure that the, the proposals in the LDP will not will ensure that there are enough school places for all our children. As you said, Councillor Jones, your number of the children may choose to go to Welsh Medium. We've got the new Welsh Medium um, opening and we've also got the Faith School. So they wouldn't all necessarily go to Tonya Rodin, but on our figures, there is capacity and there is enough surplus place in time for those children to be accommodated. Thanks, but it is a distinct possibility that the majority of children, if this application is approved, would come from this um, new housing site. It would, yes. Which would mean that we they could reach or go beyond the capacity of 334 in the school. Three, three, yeah, and 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 you've got the nursery. But what we've got is what this this site is going to take a number of years, obviously, to finish. By which time we will have completed our sort of rearrangement of the catchment areas and actually looking at where you know how with would all of the current catchment area of the town still be going to town or would the lower end be going to other parts of the school and actually looking at that so it was something that was considered and it will need a a readjustment of catchment areas not just for this um proposal but for other proposals coming through and that's what we are working on at the moment that's within our timelines to actually meet the ambitions of the ldp thank you um chair now, I'm in some difficulty. Um, I've got a number of questions which would relate to page 24, and it's headed ground conditions on that page. Um, now, we have a site which is accepted, is um, composed of shale and other waste, um, together with drainage and groundwork water problems with, which are historical. Now, uh, on page five uh, of the, the, the paper copy, um, the elected members will note, and it says the following documents have been supported in support of the application. And one of those, uh, there's 11 documents uh, referred to here, one of them, Chair, uh, the third dot down is the site investigation report. Now, um, I have no doubt that officers and planning officers have seen and read these reports from end to end. But the elected members, to my knowledge, have not been afforded um, that ability and read the reports. Um, and as, as a matter of interest, under the, those LEM reports. Uh, one of them is the air quality assessment. Well, it's two of them in air quality assessment. Another one is the drainage strategy. Um, and when you look at page 24 and the start of the first paragraph under the heading ground conditions, it states, and I quote, the application lies within an area identified by the coal authority to be at high risk from past mining activities that could have an impact on the stability of the site. As such, a site investigation report has been submitted in support of the application to assess the environmental risks. The report notes in the 1980s, the site formed part of a complex reclamation scheme, at which point it was reclaimed and landscaped to form an area of public open space with a playground. Further down in the report, um, and I quote if I can find it, uh, the court authority records also highlight there are 10 mine entries within a radius of 20 metres from the site boundaries, of which two of these are located in the northern part of the site and six either in or close to the eastern boundary of the site. Uh, it goes on to say further down the report, um, and I quote, uh, however, there is a potential for an area of made ground within the site that may pose a risk. And, and at the end of that particular paragraph, it says, as such, 
further investigations would be required and where necessary, any untreated mine entries would need to be infilled and sealed. And it also says in another paragraph under there um, that the report suggests reinforced concrete draft foundations may be an appropriate solution to address any ground stability concerns. Now, as I said, uh, the members have not received, not seen, been able to read any of these reports, including the site investigation report, which I got regard as very important to the elected members in this, you know, coming into a, uh, determining whether this application should be approved or not. And I'm going to move, Chair, that this planning meeting is deferred until the site investigation report is afforded and sent to all members, plus the drainage strategy report and the air quality assessments uh, and the technical note air quality assessment. Um, and while I'm at it, although the questions have been posed, I think we should see the transport assessment as well. And I so move that those reports are sent to us and then we will determine there is another planning meeting on the 21st of September that should give us an opportunity to have read these reports uh, beforehand. And, and can I uh, also further move that the officers that I moved this morning should also attend that meeting together with the uh, ecologist and plus the chief environmental health officer who is, uh, I understand, not there tonight, um, and plus Martin Stark as the traffic management engineer. Can I just interject, uh, Chair, just to, yes. just to raise the point, the, the documents that you've, um, that uh, Councillor Clive has, um, has highlighted there, all of those documents are actually uh, on the public access system. So they're all available for inspection online. So all those documents have been available since the, since the application has been submitted for any any member of public or or um, council councillor to 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 view and and read. Well, I I understand what you're saying. We've had this report uh, a matter of a few days in August, and I can tell you now, I for one, it, this is in recess. I've not had an opportunity in any shape or form uh, of being able to afford the time to read those reports. Now, the officers have done so. I'm, I'm pretty sure, certain that it all, most, if not all, of the planning committee members, the elected members, have had a chance to read those reports. I certainly haven't. Uh, someone else has got the hand up we'll see head, uh, head of I, planning would like to come in chair oh, oh th thanks yes okay judith uh, thank you chair sorry, yeah i, I just can't, need to i can't see who's that hand is up that's the trouble on my screen that's okay that's yeah. okay thank you chair yeah i just need to reiterate what um david cross said all members uh, members of the committee and members of the public have had access to all documents submitted with the application since the application was submitted so to say they haven't is incorrect yeah so does councillor jones still want to put it to the vote uh, that we adjourn the meeting i, well, I some... certainly do Chair? OK, in which case it needs to be seconded. It, is, is there a seconder? I'll take and I'll take one. Was that Jeremy? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. OK, well, if we put it to the vote, who's in favour of uh, deferring the meeting? How many is that? Right. Has everyone voted? I can't see myself, uh, all the numbers. So if you all put your hands to, down, uh, then. Uh, 
uh, then. Right, there's still a hand up, Chair. Oh, John, John Thomas, your hand yeah, is still yeah. up. Apologies. No, it's still up, John. All right. Oh, there we are. So, there we are. who's in favour of carrying on with the meeting today and determining the case today? I, I can't see the count. It's okay. We've had so far. We've had eight people voting, and I. I know we had two apologies, so there must be someone who hasn't voted. One oh, way or are, there the other. Any, are there any abstentions? If everyone puts a hand down. Yeah, right, there's three members not in attendance. Right, there's three members not in attendance, which means the eight people have voted. Five have voted to defer and three have voted to carry on. Yeah. So Clive's motion. Well, Yes, been voted well, on. we'll it... have to defer this meet, meeting then until the end of September. OK. OK, thanks. Uh, Clive, who's asking to speak, please? Oh, oh yes, yes, Ju Judith, yes, sorry. Sorry, Chair, it's, it's here it is. J just a quick one. Uh, when we send all these documents out, uh, they won't be coming in paper form. Uh, they will be in electric for electronic form, which can be seen on the website. So uh, there's such, such a raft of information that it, it'll be uh, economic su suicide to print all those out for each member of the committee. So uh, we'll put them, we'll, we'll pass a link uh, to our website uh, so you can see where the documents of, uh, are kept and It'll probably be helpful to uh, to to keep that uh, link to that site for any future applications that come to the planning committee. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I understand Chair, oh, why he's doing that, but I can assure you, I will be asking for a paper copy of the site investigation report to Democratic Services. Right. So the next item on the agenda, item number can six. Can I just deal oh, with oh, yes. Councillor um, Andrew Barry? who has his hand up, but of course he's oh. not actually a member of the planning committee. So um, it's the request, Chair. Could, could those documents be sent to ward members as well, please? Yeah, yeah as, we, as we mentioned, Councillor, they are all online already, so that they are all available for, for anybody to look at already online. Could, could you send me the links for that? Chair? Certainly, yeah. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. I can imagine they go to 100 pages or something, I could imagine. But uh, anyway, uh, the next item on the agenda, agenda item six, is P220075. Uh, Martin's Evan, Martin Evans House, Riverside Court. And I understand that David Cross is leading on, on this application. I am, Chair. Um, just uh, bear me a second. I'm just... The slides are going a bit slow, but I'll just try and catch up with the next Can part. we just wait for the slideshow to catch up before David starts? Yeah. <sighs> okay, I think we're there. Can you all see? Uh... Yeah, yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, the red outline here marks the, the extent of the application, uh, which includes Martin Evan House at the centre and the uh, associated car parking spaces to your side. So this application was called in by Councillor Clive Jones uh, at the time to consider the potential impacts uh, of the development on residential amenity. Uh, this uh, proposal relates to an existing office building referred to as Martin Evans House, which forms part of a small group of offices located within the town centre. Just uh... there we go. So that gives. So that these are the other office buildings. Um, Tika Hardy, and I think this is the job centre as well. 
Uh, the property uh, has been vacant for a number of years and this application seeks permission to change its use uh, to provide a bar and restaurant on the ground floor with hotel accommodation on the upper floors, which would include a total of 32 bedrooms with en suites. There would be no alterations or extensions to the exterior of the building, so all the works to convert the property would be undertaken internally only, for example, providing partitions to, to form the, the bedroom areas. As a result of the consultation exercise, there were no objections to the proposed development. However, as a result of the publicity exercise, one letter of objection was received, which raised concerns in relation to the increase in noise and disturbance in the area, the loss of privacy, uh, particularly at number 15 Dixon Street, which is the end terrace uh, just to the north of the site. And there was concerns about the potential devaluing of properties in the area. The planning consideration section of the report sets out the detailed assessment of the proposal. It's acknowledged that the principle of the, de of the development is acceptable within a sustainable town centre location and that the proposal would contribute to its wider regeneration with the reuse and um, of an otherwise vacant building. The, the development would also support local leisure and tourism economy. In respect of the noise and disturbance concerns, it is accepted that the development may generate additional activity in, the, activity in the area that could take place in the evenings and on weekends, which would differ slightly to its previous use as offices. However, having taken into account the context of the area, the location and orientation of the building in relation to the residential properties, as well as the existing parking arrangements adjacent to the building, it is not considered that the coming and goings of guests would generate significant noise and disturbance during the day and evening. Any noise associated with the bar and restaurant could also be controlled through licensing permits. In regards to the loss of privacy, it is accepted that there would be a degree of overlooking into the neighbouring rear gardens. This would be no different to the present situation. Consideration is also be given to the nature of the proposed use and the separation distance between the proposed bedrooms on the upper levels of the building and the nearby gardens. It was concluded that the impact would not significantly differ to the present situation to such an extent to amount to a sufficient reason for refusal. No, no highway, sa highway safety concerns have been raised and the development would provide sufficient off street parking is also located within walking distance of the main bus station, train stations, as well as public par car parks in the vicinity. Accordingly, it is recommended that the application be approved subject to the conditions set out on page pages 64 and 55 of the report. Uh, I think I've got a couple of photos. So as you will recall, this is the, the main entrance to, to the site. Uh, as you can see, just to the right, that, that's the, uh, the terrace properties uh, sort of set back from the, the building. The main entrance would re be retained the same. So this would be the main uh, point of entry to serve both uh, the restaurant, bar and uh, hotel rooms. Um, you can see it's kind of some distance away from those properties and it's uh, any sort of general noise of you know from people coming and going from the main entrance is, is somewhat uh, shielded by part of the building itself. Uh, just for reference this is the the car parking areas to either side of the building. Um, I think uh, at the site meeting there was concerns raised about the number of parking and and where staff staff would park um, uh, you know, during the, you know during the day and the evening, um, the park in itself is a benefit to the development. But because of its location within a town centre, there is not necessarily a specific parking requirement, other than perhaps for operational needs. So there's, I think, um, there was thirty odd spaces or 20, was it twenty nine spaces. Um, so uh, it's felt that there is sufficient capacity there to 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 serve the development and if there is a need for any more parking in the area then obviously you've got the, the near, nearby car parks public car parks this is uh just a view of the the pine end of the building uh which is what the residents were raising concerns with in terms of the overlooking from the windows uh on the ground floor that would be mostly screened by the vegetation uh, and the, the fencing, but obviously the upper windows, you know, as we saw for ourselves, um, there would be a degree of overlooking. Um, this would not be any different to the present situation. I think there's a reasonable separation distance between the development uh, and the residential properties, which is is actually a little bit more than what you would typically have where you've got, say, houses back to back. 
Um, and I would expect that those who are using the um, the the hotel accommodation, typically you would have some kind of net curtain. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think it's the, it's a use that would lend itself for people to generally, you know, um, you know, be standing by the window, you know, taking in views from from that part of the building. Uh, and this is just to, to, to sort of show the, the separation distance. So as you can see, you've got uh, the car parking area and then there's an area of vacant land. Uh, I'm not quite sure who owns it, whether it's number 15 or, or separately privately owned land, uh, but it's heavily overgrown and it seems to occasionally accommodate parked vehicles. Um, so you can see the separation distance here is quite it's quite a distance and it's it's more than that, which I would say you would expect from uh, properties back to back. There's there's also a degree of overlooking already uh, from the, the buildings opposite, uh, which are, uh, I guess are currently used as office space uh, at the moment. Um, and that's it from me, if there's any questions. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Jones, have you got a question? Yes, uh, Chair. I, I know we were at a site meeting um, and I've read the uh, this report again. Um, I have to disagree with David Cross and uh, question him again in relation to the privacy aspect. Um, does David Cross uh, agree that having been the site on the site meeting and looked at the levels of the first floor and the top floor, where there would be four bedrooms on each floor, there's eight in total, overlooking Dixon Street, but particularly number 15, which is right next door to it, does he accept, uh, and, and particularly the people in number 15, um, with this being a change of use from offices to uh, an hotel um, in use, seven days a week. Um, and you refer you to the fact that the hotel bedrooms may be in use during the evenings on the weekends. It would be maybe they will be in use on daytime evenings and weekends. That that will be um, a lack of privacy, particularly with the people living at number 15. And I did mention on behalf of the resident of number 15 at the site meeting because I was advised that there were trees there originally and I was told um, yes they were uh, cut down so there was um, a bit of a barrier between these windows and number 15 but clearly that whatever was there has been taken away. Um, OK, a few things. <laughs> uh, well, just to start with the tree issue, just uh, since that was the last thing you commented on there. Um, yes, uh, I think it was highlighted by the applicant that there, there were some trees. Uh, I think looking at Google images, I think they were uh, relatively close to the building. Um, my understanding is that uh, those trees were causing damage to the existing lighting, uh, street lighting there, which was part of the reason why they were moved. Um, it, uh, I mean, I've got no that those trees were gone before this application uh, was submitted, so I can't really comment on what sort of effect it had in terms of screening and uh, any privacy. Uh, I'd be surprised if they were able to screen all of the windows because obviously they didn't. Uh, the, tre the trees, from what I understand, didn't span um, the full width or depth of that building, and I, I'm not sure if they were of a height where they would have entirely screened um uh, any view out, outlook view from those from those upper levels uh, but notwithstanding that obviously the trees themselves were not protected so the fact that they've been removed is outside of our control and we we've had to assess the application based on the site circumstance as it is in terms of the general overlooking um i don't think i've tried to uh uh, to ignore the fact that there is a degree of overlooking. I think there is a degree of overlooking, and that was obviously evident um, when we were on site. But part of what we've got to look at is uh, to, to what extent is that any worse than the current situation? 
at the moment that building can be used as offices and you could have desks placed at every single win at every single window and someone could be sat there throughout the day and would have full oversight of uh, like those neighboring properties the similar similar situation could happen uh, in terms of a hotel room but i think the nature of how hotel rooms are used is slightly different so even though it might be used in the evenings and on weekends it's not uh, typical, I would say, for persons to often spend any time in those bedrooms and to be, spend any time uh, looking out those, those of those windows. There's no balconies or anything like that which might encourage that sort of activity. The the vast majority of people would probably use that room to to either as a you know somewhere to rest while visiting other people or if they're on a business trip or you know doing some other entertainment. So it's it's more. I don't think it's it's not like um, that people are going to be spending any time in their rooms, you know, with an outlook, which to to a greater extent of how it might be used as an office. If anything, it, you could argue that uh, the, the the number of people actually looking out the window might be less uh, in the evenings. You would typically expect people to probably close the curtains as well. So that would you know limit any outlook, you know, if they're getting changed or using the rooms and sleeping. So. Um, so no, I would disagree that the, the, the that there's a, a an increase of overlooking that is far worse than than it presently is. All I can share is that we'll never agree. We'll have to agree to disagree on that particular aspect of it. And um, whilst uh, David Cross mentioned about the trees, I think that's a lot of nonsense that they were cut down to avoid damage to the lighting uh, poles there. If that's the case, I think the authorities, officers who are responsible for this need to go look throughout the county better where trees are blocking lights uh, working properly because they haven't been cut back. But without a shadow of doubt, Chair, there is and will be because it's a change of use seven days a week, um, you know, People will, a natural reaction, if they book the room, uh, they enter the room, they will inevitably look to see what's outside, what they view in. And there are eight rooms there that, in my opinion, will be used constantly seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, and will be doing so. And the, in these cases, those rooms will look directly into the rear garden of number 15 and a few other properties in Dixon Street. Yeah. If you've got any other questions, Clive? No, Chair. No, no. Has anyone else got any questions? No, there's no questions. Has anyone got any comments to make? Uh, no, no, there's no comments. So we'll put it to the vote then. The, the recommendation is oh, that. Oh, sorry, we have to have a proposal. Yeah, propo yeah, is someone going to pro uh, propose the recommendation that be accepted? Yeah, Scott? I'll propose that. I'll propose that, Chair. Right. I'll well, I'll second it then, Chair. Second it, lovely. So we'll put it. Uh, to the vote. So the recommendation is that it be approved. So those in favour of it being approved, vote now. Oh. Okay. Uh, hey. Yes, I, I'm having difficulty. Right. With mine a sec. Ah, there we are. There we are. So those in favour. Yeah, they've all yes. voted, Chair. Yeah, and uh, if you, everyone puts a hand down. Are those against the proposal? Oh, there's none. Are there any abstentions? No. So what was the count, Garrett? Well, you know, we had seven in favour. We have Councillor Clive Jones, Chair. Chair. You have... Oh, it, could I just clarify, Councillor Clive oh, Jones, okay. whether you're for or against? I'm just waiting for the abstention. I right, the abstention. Yeah. Right, that's fine. When, when so one abstention. On, we'll be after that. 
Yeah, one abstention yeah. and seven in favour, Chair. Favour. Oh, so the, the recommendation is approved then. So uh, the next item on the agenda, well, the next three items on the agenda, information reports. Uh, I've not got any other urgent business. Is there any any business? No, we sorted out the rights of way. So that's, uh, we close the meeting then. Okay then. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks. 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 Bye. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.